So vaporization and vapor pressure. Molecules in, a, in liquid water are constantly moving. They're sliding around to, next to each other. If we have an open beaker, we've got all these guys moving around. Some of the molecules that are near the surface have enough energy to escape. The temperature of the water measures the average kinetic energy. Some of the molecules have higher kinetic energy, some have lower. If you get a high kinetic energy molecule headed in the right direction at the surface, it can just escape. Then you have water molecules bouncing around in the air, and some of them, if they're moving towards the water, when they collide with the water, they'll get trapped and they'll recondense. Um, what the water molecules are doing in liquid water is sometimes described as a wild dance floor. Imagine just a bunch of crazy teenagers, um, just, it's just a crazy dance floor, right? The, the transition from liquid to gas is known as vaporization. The opposite, going from a gas to a liquid, is called condensation. So average kinetic energy increases with temperature. And here, lower temperature, the average kinetic energy is going to be lower. High temperature, the average kinetic energy is going to be higher. But what happens at higher temperatures is that the energy distribution also spreads out. And so up here, this is representing the minimum kinetic energy needed to escape or to evaporate. At a higher temperature, we have more particles that have enough kinetic energy to escape. And so vaporization will occur more quickly at a higher temperature. And, and we observe that in everyday life. It rained the other day, right? And so the rain on, gets the sidewalk wet. It was cold. It was only 50-ish, right? Did the water evaporate quickly? No, it took a while for the sidewalks to dry up after it quit raining. If you take the garden hose and spray the sidewalk in August when it's 109, does it evaporate more quickly? Yeah, it does. You can almost watch it evaporate, right? It, it's just so quick at the higher temperature because more of the particles have enough energy to just get into the gas state. So we can increase the rate of, vapor, of vaporization by increasing the temperature. We can also increase rate of evaporation by increasing the surface area. In order for molecules to escape, to become vaporized, they have to be at the surface. If the surface area is very small, the rate of vaporization is going to be low. So if you have a glass of water, or if you take that same amount of water and spill it on the floor, which is going to evaporate faster? The water you spilled on the floor, right? Because it's all spread out. It's got a large surface area. It can evaporate from all over the place. The glass of water is going to take days to evaporate. The puddle, on the wa puddle of water on the floor will be gone before the end of the day. We also see a difference in rate of evaporation or vaporization um, based on intermolecular forces. So if, if your liquid has strong intermolecular forces, then it's going to evaporate more slowly. So we describe things as volatile or non-volatile. Volatile means it evaporates or vaporizes easily, things like alcohol or acetone. Non-volatile is something that does not vaporize easily, something like vegetable oil. Does vegetable oil evaporate? Doesn't seem to, does it? It'll just sit there forever, it seems. So that would be considered a non-volatile liquid. So let's think about that beaker with water in it. And let's think it, um, let's imagine that it's thermally insulated. So it's not going to be absorbing or giving off any energy to the surroundings. It's isolated. What happens to the temperature of it as 
molecules evaporate. It's going to cool down. Because which molecules are evaporating? The ones with the higher kinetic energy. If you're losing all of the molecules with the high kinetic energy, what happens to the average kinetic energy of what's left? It goes down. And so the evaporation cools the water. This is why when we get sweaty in the summer, it cools us off. Because our bodies sweat and produce moisture on our skin. As that evaporates, it takes heat with it and cools us off. Vaporization is an endothermic process. If vaporization is endothermic, then condensation is exothermic. Vaporization being endothermic makes sense. It's like, well, what if I want to get water to go into the gas state? I want to make steam. Well, am I going to put it in the freezer or am I going to put it on the stove and light the burner? I'm going to put it on the stove. I'm going to put energy into it, and I can vaporize the liquid faster. Endothermic process. If that direction is endothermic, the opposite of condensation has to be exothermic. When a gas condenses into a liquid, it releases energy. And this is why steam can cause a much more severe burn than hot water can. Because as the steam condenses, it releases a tremendous amount of energy, causing a burn. The energetics of the vaporization and the condensation have a lot to do with climate. Daily temperature variations in regions such as Fresno with low humidity are extreme. I mean, we can have 40 degree temperature variations from morning to night, right? It could be 60 at night and 100 during the day. Other places, like at the coast, it might be 65 at night and 70 at the hottest part of the day because there's more humidity in the air, because there's the ocean there, and the, the vaporization and the condensation moderate the temperature. Well, there's energy involved in vaporization. So, of course, then we can do some calculations. Um, the heat, or more technically, the enthalpy of vaporization, which is symbolized delta H, VAP, is the amount of heat required to vaporize one mole of liquid at its normal boiling point. So it takes 40.7 kilojoules of energy to vaporize one mole of water at 100 degrees Celsius. Heat of vaporization is always positive because vaporization is always an endothermic process. Um, it is somewhat temperature dependent, but not as much as you might think. 